I'm in Luke chapter 16. We start at verse 19. It's entitled, The Rich Man and Lazarus. This is not Lazarus who was raised from the dead. This is just a fictional person because in that day and age, guess what name almost everybody had? Lazarus. It was like, a common name. It was Bob. It was Bill. It was something like that for our day and age. Um, lots of people had it. Joe. So this is the rich man and Joe, Bill, Bob, and Lazarus. So let's start reading in verse 19. There was a rich man who was clothed in purple and fine linen and who feasted sumptuously every Day. And at his gate was laid a poor man named Lazarus, covered with sores, who desired to be fed with what fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, even the dogs came and licked his sores. The poor man died and was carried by the angels to Abraham's side. The rich man also died. And was buried. And in Hades, being in torment, he lifted up his eyes and saw Abraham far off and Lazarus by his side. And he called out, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus to dip the end of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am in anguish. In this flame. But Abraham said, Child, remember that you in your lifetime received your good things, and Lazarus in like manner bad things. But now he is comforted here, and you are in anguish. And besides all this, between us and you, there's a great chasm that has been fixed in order that those who would pass from here to you may not be able, and none may cross from there to us. And he said, Then I beg you, Father, to send him to my father's house, for I have five brothers, so that he may warn them, lest they also come into this place of torment. But Abraham said, They have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. And he said, no, Father Abraham. But if someone goes to them from the dead, they will repent. He said to him, if they do not hear Moses and the prophets, neither will they be convinced if someone should rise from the dead. And this is the gospel, that would be the good news. <laughs> this is the gospel, the good news of God. And I'm still going to respond, wow, thanks be to God. Thanks be to God. Um, now, is this, does it sound like good news to everybody? Yes or no? Does it sound like half good news? And half really not good news? Yeah. Uh, is that reality? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I know there are some people that have never uh, walked through these doors before. They're with us for the very first time. Welcome to Community of Hope and our sermon on hell. <laughs> you picked a doozy of a week to come. Um, but I'm not going to shy away from it. I, I can't shy away from it. I'm going to shy away from nothing that is revealed in the Word of God. And this is revealed in the Word of God. So let's look at it and let's try to understand it. And let's figure out why did Jesus tell this parable? Why did he tell the story? And what were the circumstances? We always have to go back in time 2,000 years and put ourselves in the circumstances that Jesus told this. Because... It was slightly different than today. Rather than trying to bring him in and make everything apply to Star Wars The Force Awakens or something like that. Okay, Now that's kind of fun and good to do on occasion. And to teach people something about God through uh, something in the present day. And we will probably do that at at some point. Um, But what he really desires us to do is go back in time. And to sit at his feet. And to be surrounded by that day, 
that age and these people and this community. And then things begin to make sense. And a little bit more light is shed on the passage that we're trying to discuss. So, Luke chapter 16. What do we need to know about this passage? Well, uh, the main point is very simple. Jesus is teaching the reality of what happens in the future. And he's teaching the reality that there are two options. That there is a heaven and that there is a hell. I will not do, so we have heaven over here. I'm not going to do that today. Okay? A lot of times I do over here we have and over here we have. I'm not going to put you in hell. I'm going to put them in hell instead today. So, no. um, We're not going to do that today. Because I don't don't want to joke about that. I don't want to, I don't desire that anyone... And you start thinking in your mind. Start thinking ISIS. Start thinking way back Bin Laden. Start thinking about Hitler. Start, go, go back. Go back to serial killers. Go back to pedophiles. And, and I don't desire that anyone would be in hell. I desire that everyone would come to know the mercy and the love and the grace that has been given through Jesus Christ. And I hope we all have that desire. Because that's Jesus' heart. We heard that and saw that last week. And the week before, as we looked at Luke chapter 15, the week before, and and God's heart is for people to know him. And even if they've blown it and messed up royally, and that parable in Luke chapter 15, if you weren't here, it was a parable of a son who truly did everything you could do that would be breaking the Jewish laws as badly as you can break them, and to disrespect God his family, and to disrespect his father. And then he went and lived in the most gluttonous, um, obvious sin you can imagine. And the father welcomed him home without even a lecture. Instead, he threw a party. And he killed the fattened calf. Because God loves when we come back. And his desires that every single one of us in this world would return to him and come back because he desires all to be saved and to come to a knowledge of the truth. And so we saw in verse 14 that the Pharisees who were lovers of money heard all these things and they ridiculed him. And that's still the context for Jesus telling this parable. He's surrounded by these Pharisees and not only are they lovers of money, guess how they got all their money? How did the Pharisees get all their money? Through what? Religion. The Pharisees got all their money through religion. It was through their position. It was through their religiosity. And they they took and they took and they took. And they were no respecters of the poor. And so in this parable we have a rich man and we have Lazarus who represents the poor. And the rich man represents the Pharisees. And all those who maybe are filled with religiosity but truly don't believe in what God has revealed in Scripture. And, and I hope you caught this last line. Neither will, be, will they be convinced if someone should rise from the dead. Whoa, what is Jesus about to do? And what are the Pharisees going to do with that? Not believe it. I mean, he just comes right out before he gives his life. And I know we're celebrating Christmas, not Easter here, but um, he's predicting what's going to happen. And he's saying, I'm going to rise from the dead. And you're still not going to believe it. They've got Moses. They got the prophets. They got the word of God. I'm, I'm right here in front of you. If they don't believe all this, they got nothing. They got nothing. So let's go back. Let's just look at some details. Starting at verse 19. The rich man. um, Why was he rich? Well, in that day and age when we're sitting in those shoes, we have those sandals on, and we're walking in the dust, and we're listening to Jesus, um, there was this common belief that if you were rich, you were blessed by God. And if you were poor, you were cursed by God. Fair enough, right? God likes you, and you've been good, and he gives you blessings, God doesn't like you and then you're cursed and you got nothing. And you just got to suffer. And and so in that day and age, the religious leaders saw wealth as a sign of, I mean, this is the first um, prosperity gospel. It was the Pharisees. It was the first prosperity gospel. 
That God's going to give you what you want. And if he gives you what you want, that means you're going to be in heaven. And if you're poor and sick and hurting and you got diseases, that's God's curse on you and you're going to be in hell. And that was the thinking in that day and age. Um, there's even a little bit of that in our day and age. And it just shows itself in different ways um, with, you know, pastors in certain states driving like $3.2 million vehicles uh, that go incredible speeds that would be really fun to drive, but that we don't need. Uh, no, I'm not coveting. I want a $3.2 million raise. That's all. Um, no, I don't desire that. And so there is some of this out there. But that's just not the way it works. And so Jesus completely turns the tables here. And he puts the rich man in hell. And he puts the poor man with all the sores in heaven. And the Pharisees are once again just angry. Because that's not in their minds the way it all works. So there's a rich man who is clothed in purple and fine linen. This guy is the extreme wealth. Extreme wealth. When you're clothed in purple, it was a very rare dye. Fine linen um, was this, this wool that was prepared in a special way. Almost like the finest of Egyptian cotton. Um, and, and so this guy was decked out in the best stuff all the time. And he feasted sumptuously. It's a word I like to use every single day. Um, feasted sumptuously every day. I mean, he ate like it was a banquet every single day. And who was sitting right outside? It's not just like his front door. I mean, this is the gate to his estate. That's what the word means for the door here. Um, uh, there was a man named Lazarus covered with sores who desired to be fed. He was at his gate, the gate to his big kingdom, the gate to his big estate. Um, it, it also, sorry, my page flip, um, was laid a poor man. That the word laid really means he was dumped off. It doesn't mean laid down gently. It may, basically means he's paralyzed. He can't move. He was picked up and he was just brought and tossed at this man's gate. So that he could beg and hopefully receive something from the rich man. Remember this is a parable. These are fictional characters. It's just supposed to teach us a point. And so we'll get to the point. But let's learn some of the things along the way. So he's laying there. He's a poor man. So in their minds and in their eye. He is cursed by God. And he's covered with sores. And he desired to be fed even with the crumbs that fell from the table. Uh, the practice in that day and age for the very wealthy, they didn't have paper products. They don't have napkins. They don't have bounty, the quicker picker upper. Uh, they don't have paper towels. They don't have anything like that. They didn't have those little wet wipes that we like to use. They definitely didn't have antibacterial that half of you people have in your purse right now because uh, you're kind of germaphobes, you know, and you just can't handle that. Um, they, they didn't have any of this stuff. And so what did they do? Well, they took bread. And this was the stale bread. This is like the three-day-old bread from Panera or something like that. So this is stale bread that they would take. So it was kind of hardened, but it would still sop up. They ate a lot of soupy stew sort of thingies. Um, and so first, the way they would eat is with the good fresh bread. And they would dip it in the stew and dip it in their liquid broth. And that's the way they would eat things because they don't have spoons and they don't have forks. They're like cavemen. I know. It's like, oh, they didn't have forks? See, mom and dad, I don't need to eat with a fork. It's biblical. Um, so they would use bread and they would sop it up. But what would happen to their hands and their mouths when they don't have napkins? You got sop all over you. And they, because they'd get all dirty with this stew stuff because they don't have spoons. And they would use then the stale bread and rub their hands with the stale bread to sop up the extra stuff and get the big stuff off. And then they would probably lick their hands to get the rest. And that's kind of the way they did it. And then they would wash their hands, I'm sure, in some water. But they had to get that big stuff off. 
And so they used bread. Well, when they would clean their hands with the stale bread, what would happen to little bitty pieces of bread? It would fall to the ground. And what would happen when they were done with the sopped up bread? They toss it to the ground. Well, that brings in the dogs. Now, this is not cute little, oh, Chrissy Poo. No, this is not your cute little pet dog. These are like the dogs that you might see in Guatemala. The dogs in Mexico, they're scavengers. They hunt food. They go wherever there is food. And they come in and they're going to rip the, the bread out of your hand if you try to pick it up. And he longs to be fed and to fight with the dogs to get a little bit of those crumbs that are under the rich man's table. That's how hungry this man is. And that's how poor this man is. And that's how hopeless his circumstances are in this world. Well, the poor man died and was carried by the angels to Abraham's side. No, we don't necessarily believe that's reality. This is, we believe, part of the story, part of the parable. Eventually, we be in, we're going to be in heaven, but the angels don't just like pick us up and stuff like that. And contrary to a great movie, every time a bell rings, an angel doesn't get his wings so he can carry you to heaven. Um, the poor man died, was carried by the angels to Abraham's side. The rich man died and was buried and in Hades... Jesus' word, not mine. Jesus' teaching, not mine. In Hades, hell, torment, anguish. We hear it three times in the next three verses. So he's carried to Hades, number one, in verse 23, being in torment. Number two, in verse 24, I am in anguish in this flame. And then again in verse 26, I believe. Oh, no. 25. At the very end, Abraham speaking, and you are in anguish. This guy is in unstoppable suffering. What is part of our hope as believers in Christ here in this world? What is part of our hope? It's temporary. What do we all need to know? It's temporary. And the suffering that we will face, guess what it is as a true believer in Jesus Christ? Let's all say it together. It's temporary. And that is not the picture Jesus is painting here of the other alternative. Of Hades or hell. It's not temporary. The suffering. Imagine the most intense suffering. Women, not too hard for you to do if you're born a child, right? And you're going, what do you know of it? Nothing. Nothing. I'm not even going to try. Okay? I had a cramp in my calf once. That was about it. I know nothing of pain. And you know maybe something of pain that I've never experienced. But you try to take that and then live with it forever. The most severe pain you can imagine, and it never goes away. That's not the way we live in this world. We have hope, and it's hope that this is temporary, and there's something on the other side because there is a hell, but there's a heaven. And in heaven, all that pain, and all the hurt, and all the discomfort, and all the disease, and all the tears, all of it. Is removed. All of it is taken away. I mean, we have this incredible hope. Because we know this is not really our home. It's a temporary staging grounds for us to be taken home. But Jesus is describing a place here. That has unquenchable torment. And anguish. He's in anguish. He's tormented. He wants Lazarus. The poor man that he would have nothing to do with in this world. To come down from heaven by Abraham's side. And to dip his finger. His so finger with blisters and sores on it. Notice he didn't ask Abraham to come. He asked Lazarus, the servant, the poor guy to come. But even with all his sores. To dip his finger in water. And simply to touch it to the rich man's tongue to relieve the suffering, even if it was just for a moment. And is that possible? 
No. Can't do it. Because it is unquenchable suffering. And let me ask you this as well. Because there's this passage about the worm never dying and this whole thing. Um, it, it's in scripture. And, and this unquenchable suffering. This, this never ending suffering. Um, have any of you ever missed out on an opportunity? Maybe it was an opportunity to, to date someone. Maybe it was an opportunity to make some money. Maybe it was an opportunity um, to get this job and you just didn't do what it took. Have you ever missed out an opportunity and you remember it to this day? Anybody ever experienced anything like that? Okay, a few of you. Have any of you ever hurt someone and you remember it to this day because you feel horrible and guilty because you hurt somebody? Would you do me a favor and raise your hand? A lot more hands starting to go up. You know that kind of anguish, that guilt that surrounds your mind? It's not just a physical, it's an emotional a mental anguish? That is what hell is described as here. The rich man in hell has a clear conscience, consciousness of what he had on this earth, what he did and didn't do, and what he will never get to experience. It's guilt. It's I can't believe it. I should have. I should have. I should have. I should have believed. I should have believed. I should have given my life Given my heart, Jesus, I should have, I should have, I should have. And it never ends. Can you imagine that torment? I should have, 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 I should have. And it never shuts off. Oh, it's misery. It's anguish. It's torment. And the flames aren't just for decoration all the time. When this place, Gehenna, or Hades, or hell is described, it's described as flames that never fully consume, but they're flames that inflict pain, torment, and anguish constantly. And so Jesus is laying this out. Here's an option. Sorry, it's not over here. It's kind of there. There's an option. And then there's another option. Now, why did the poor man get to go? Just because he was poor and why did the rich man go to hell? Just because he was rich, we got to answer that question. No. No. To both of them. The poor man did not get to go to hell because, uh, did not get to go to heaven because he was poor on this earth and so God just said, oh, now come to heaven and you can have good stuff. And the rich man did not go to hell just because he was rich on the earth and you have to go to hell if you're rich. No. No. Common beliefs, um, incorrect beliefs. The fact that the poor man has a name. Why in a parable did Jesus name the character? Well, I believe it's because of the name Lazarus. Basically, if you translate the word Lazarus, do you know what it means? That's what I thought. I didn't either. I didn't either. I mean, I've been a pastor 18 years and I've never studied to find out what Lazarus means. It basically means... One who has been helped. One who has been helped by God. How was this man helped by God? God reached down and saved him. It's what God had done for him. That's what Lazarus means. Oh, what God has done for me. Oh, how he has helped me. And so what Jesus is saying is the rich man, with all of his religiosity, he was probably in in the parable because he calls on father Abraham. He was an Israelite. He was part of the Jewish race. Maybe speaking directly to the Pharisees. And he's saying your religiosity will not save you. And it won't do it for us either. Religiosity doesn't do anything for anybody. And I know that's a word that I don't even know it's a real word. I think it should be. I kind of made it up. But it fits. And so Jesus says to the Pharisees, you've missed out on what really matters. And Lazarus had it because that's his name. It's, oh, what God has done for me, how he has helped me. In the parable, he's one who had been touched by the saving grace 
of Jesus Christ and then lifted out of his misery on this earth and enjoying complete and utter beauty and perfection in heaven. And you see this complete reversal. Everything that the rich man had on earth and the poor man had had on earth is now reversed in heaven and in hell in eternity. And so the rich man gets the suffering that the poor man experienced and the poor man gets the scrumptious feasts that the rich man experienced and all kinds of comfort being in the presence of God. And so it's this complete reversal that happens from this world to the next world. And so let's just wrap this up and sum it up with again what's the final point well it gets to Abraham's words in this parable in the story at the very end because the rich man has a conscience and he he doesn't notice what he doesn't do what doesn't he do here what doesn't he do he doesn't ask for forgiveness and he doesn't try to plead his case He knows now. He's asking for a little relief. But he isn't saying, please give me another chance. Please let there be a purgatory. Please let there be this. Be it. And and in my belief, and and this is nothing against any other faith. This is just, I I think that's wrong. There is no purgatory. That's not biblical. And that's not a bash against a, a different religion. It's just... Sometimes we get things right and sometimes we get things wrong. And I believe that's wrong. According to scripture, no. Jesus is teaching. I mean, when you die, it it starts for your soul. It starts. Judgment is sealed. It's done. You don't get another chance. You can't go back and forth and have a middle ground where maybe you can work your way there. It doesn't happen that way. He doesn't say, pray for my brothers that they would pray for me that my... My time would be cut short and I could go to heaven. Let me get released. Let me get out of here. He accepts his consequences because he knows there's finality here. He is where he is. And all he's asking for is a little bit of relief from the never-ending suffering. It, It teaches us a lot. Jesus teaches us a lot. Now, do we believe that if you're in hell, you can see into heaven? No. That's part of the story just to help get the point across. Do we believe in heaven that we can look down and see maybe even people we love in hell? No, because then how would you be at peace? How would there be no tears? No, no, you can't cross over. You can't see through it. It doesn't work that way. It's final. It's the end. And it lasts forever. And so he says to Abraham, not please get me out of here. But he says, please, I have five brothers. Send Lazarus to warn them. Because if someone rises from the dead, they know Lazarus. They saw him every time they walked into my estate. Because they live there too. They'll know Lazarus. And if if he comes back from the dead, they're going to know it. In the story. And so then Abraham, who is the voice of Jesus, the voice of God here, says they have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. In other words, it's all right here. Everything they needed to know is right here. This isn't a matter of them not having enough information. They had all the information they needed. Everybody in this world has all the information they needed. It's a matter of how we receive it or how we reject it. That's all that matters. Do we receive it or do we reject it? Do we believe it and believe what it says or do we mock it and run away from it? So he said, no, Father Abraham, this is now the rich man in hell. But if someone goes to them from the dead, they will repent. And Jesus in this story predicts his own death, predicts his own resurrection. And he's looking right at the Pharisees and saying, you're not going to believe even when I rise from the dead. Because your hearts are hardened. Because you had it all. You killed the prophets before you. And now you're going to kill me. And I'm going to rise from the dead. And you're still not going to believe it. 
And so you got all the information you need. You just need to open your eyes and open your heart to what it's trying to say and to the truth. So he said, if they do not hear Moses and the prophets, then their hearts are hardened, basically. And neither will they be convinced if someone should rise from the dead. So what do we do with this? Um, Well, first and foremost, we treat it as reality. Jesus is teaching this. It's not a fictional thing that the church made up to scare people. And you know me, I'm such a hell, fire, and brimstone preacher. Um, No. I want to be a preacher of grace. But it is reality. And there are some who will reject the grace of God. And even the resurrection from the dead isn't going to change their minds or their hearts. And, and here's a big thing. The rich guy that ended up in hell on earth was the religious guy who didn't expect to be in hell. Hell will be filled with people who didn't expect to be in hell. Either because they were religious and they thought they should be in heaven because of all the great things they did or how perfectly they tried to do it or they didn't believe it. They didn't think it was real and they don't think they should be in hell because, but I didn't think it was real. I didn't think he was, I thought he was fictional. I thought they made him up just to give themselves a crutch because they were weak, those Christians Hell is filled with people who never thought that they would be there. And do you want them there? I don't. I don't want you there. I don't want me there. And it isn't about, oh, well, if there's a poor man, we have to, you know, Gina, I love the the story and the message of hope. And actually, I think she's back there right now. Um, but it isn't, I better start buying more people lunch because that's going to that's gonna earn my way to heaven. No, no. No, if the rich man had fed Lazarus and, and still not believed in Jesus, he still would have gone to hell. If he hadn't looked at the prophets and seen the word of God and what it said, he still would have ended up in hell. And so it isn't, it isn't about how much we do or how religious we are. It's about where's our heart? Have we truly received the word of God and the grace of God and the mercy of God as it has been revealed to us in Jesus Christ? Because that is our what? Hope. That is our hope. Jesus is our hope. And so all I want to say today is for us, let's never get caught up in religiosity. Okay? What are we called to be? We're called to be followers of Christ. We're called to be the church. We're going to talk about that when we get to our meeting in a little bit. That's what we're called to be. We're not called to be religious. We're not called to try to look good for everybody else and to go through all the motions and try to earn anything. We're not called to do that. We are called to submit our lives like we sang in that song, to give him our hearts, to give him our lives, to give him everything and say, God, Jesus, it's all yours. I I surrender it to you. Use me as you want to use me. What do you mean you want me to speak to them? That petrifies me. But use me as you want to use me. What do you mean you want me to give that away? That petrifies me. But use me as you want to use me. Because I'm going to follow you and I'm going to do what you ask me to do. And I pray that it's all for the glory of your name, God. And so let's never be the religious one. And let's just examine our hearts. And then let's go and share. Let's share good news. Let's share hope. Let's share love. Let's share grace. Let's continue to tell people that there is something waiting for them even if they're experiencing hardship in this world. And one day it'll all be removed for believers in Jesus Christ and they will be in the presence of God forever. Forever. So let's believe it. Let's not get caught up in religiosity. 
And then let's share the good news of Jesus. Can you join me? Let's pray. Lord God, we're about to come and receive a gift. And we're not worthy. And so, Lord, the first thing that we have to realize as we come and receive this gift is we're not worthy. I don't come to receive this because I'm worthy of it. I come to receive this because I'm not worthy and I need it. Because I need you, Jesus. And we believe this is your body and your blood. This is a gift that you gave because you gave your life. And you gave us this meal and you said, I want you to do this and remember me. Remember my sacrifice. Because as you take the, the bread, it's, it's my body. As you take the wine, it's my blood. I'm present here. My sacrifice is present here. And so Jesus, just come in and, and speak into our hearts and speak into our lives. The truth. That we're not worthy. And yet that you love us. And yet that you offer us forgiveness and grace. That's why you went to the cross. To take all of our mistakes. All of our unworthiness. And to put it on your shoulders. As the perfect lamb. The sacrificial lamb. A person who would go to the cross. Taking all of our sins. And all of our ugliness. And all of our mistakes. Assuming it. Taking it upon yourself. Becoming the sinner. And paying the price that had to be paid, which was death. But then rising victorious from the grave and offering us life. God, we give you praise and we give you thanks. 